and welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. My name is Scott Daly, and I am your host, and I'm joined, as always, by a guy I just met on some message board somewhere. It's Matt Freeman. How's it going today, Matt? Ah, it's pretty good. Let's go murder some people. Yeah, I've been having these weird visions of been, uh, yeah. pitchforks. Been having, I, yeah, God told me to make this terrifying weapon, so <laughs> going to do it. But it's not a weapon, it's a tool. It's, it's a just tool. a tool. Yeah, yeah. It's a tool for removing <laughs> brains from skulls. Sure. This week on the show, we are finally chatting about the newest M. Night Shyamalan film, Knock at the Cabin. I have been looking forward to this for quite a while, Matt, since I saw this movie back when it came out in January, and so I'm glad we finally get to chat about it. And I had not seen it until uh, this week. So Yeah. Uh, after that, we're going to get into the results from our canon episode last month on the movie Being There, and then we got to talk about the latest thing that's happening in the world of entertainment, and that is the Writers Guild going on strike. WGA on strike. Uh, no more writing forever until those two sides work it out. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, some information. I, I've been reading a lot about this and listening to a lot of podcasts on this this week because I was very curious about, you know, what's going on here. Why did the negotiations break down? That kind of thing. And uh, I think it'll be it'll be informative to get into this because it's going to affect basically everyone because we all watch so much television and movies. Um, so yeah and it's really interesting actually and it there's a lot of stuff that i didn't know uh, you were explaining yeah. this to me earlier but i look forward to hearing the whole scoop from you yeah yeah it'll be good but first let's get into m night Shyamalan's knock at the cabin my name's leonard it's nice to meet you, Will. Why are you here? I suppose I'm here to make friends with you. And your dad's too. But my heart is broken. Why is it broken? Because of what I have to do today. There is a woman carrying something that looks like a pick with a chain and a mallet head. See, the four of us have a very important job to do. In fact, it might be the most important job in the history of the world. Matt, what is this movie all about? While vacationing, a girl and her parents are taken hostage by armed strangers who demand that the family make a choice to avert the apocalypse. This movie was written by M. Night Shyamalan and Steve Desmond. It is based on the novel of the same name by Paul Tremblay. Or, sorry, it's not of the same name. It's based on the novel A Cabin at the End of the World by Paul Tremblay and is directed of course by M. Night Shyamalan. It stars Dave Bautista, Jonathan Groff, and Ben Aldridge. All right, Matt. Um I think I think I know the answer to one of these questions, but uh what did you think of this movie? Um I'm so it's interesting cuz cuz you you think you know me, Scott. Um uh, so 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 I love M. Night Shyamalan as you're mm -hmm. aware. Um Yeah. And I thought this movie was uh just a great thriller like it, was, it mm -hmm. was very it hooked me very quickly and it had me going pretty much the whole time um i really enjoyed the the pacing and the sort of back and forth of, of tension and playing with your expectations uh of what's going to happen um i thought the performances were all really solid this might be just sort of o overall the best of the films that he's put out out of the last few um mm -hmm. overall i have very positive feelings toward this yeah, but, movie um, <laughs> okay before you go on though i want to okay. guess because uh -huh. here's I, I, here, here's what my guess was okay i figured you were going to enjoy this movie i figured you were going to like all the technical aspects of it my guess was that you were going to be very disturbed and put out by the conclusion that this movie comes to at the end of it. Yeah, you're correct. Um, <laughs> I mean, if and, and, it, and I guess here's the thing, though. I don't really hold that against the film. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's more like the film gives you this conundrum, this, this uh, you know, almost Abraham sacrificing Isaac style of moral problem where um, it, it touches on all of these, 
you know, deep moral and ethical intuitions that you have. Mm. And, and yes, I do have my answer, which is the kind of God that would demand this of me is not a God that's worth sacrificing my family for. Um, so if that's the world that we live in, then I'm not, not going to do it. Yeah. Um, and also that, there's like a creepy undertone that like the people make these horrifying weapons and, and it's, it's all very creepy and evil. And I'm like, I don't, I don't feel like this is, I don't feel like I'm supposed to do this. I feel like passing the test is actually refusing to make the sacrifice. Um, but then they do make the sacrifice. And and again, don't hold it against the movie. I just was like, eh, okay, that's the way they chose to go. All right, fine. Yeah, I mean, I think this is worth talking about because, you know, we mentioned that this is based on a, a novel written by Paul Tremblay. And the novel, spoilers for that, ends very differently from the way this movie ends. Um, the okay. novel ends kind of in the way you just said. Um, in in the book, you know, when um, one of the characters goes to their car to get the gun, there is a struggle over the gun. Um, and it goes off, uh, inadvertently killing Len, the, the young girl. Oh, okay. um, wow. and so she dies and then the two husbands are like, okay, so this is awful, but like she died, that's the sacrifice. Right. And then they're told, no, it has to be a willing sacrifice. That wasn't a willing sacrifice. It doesn't count. You still have to choose between the two of you. And they basically say what you, exactly what you said, a person that would, would demand we do this and then also allow the our daughter to die and then not count that on a technicality is not any kind of fucking person we want to deal with and basically the book ends with them walking off together into the apocalypse everyone has died except for the two of them uh -huh. um and and that is a very different ending right that is and that i think the, the the most fascinating thing about this movie to me is that is the ending that i think most people would do to a story like this you know mm -hmm. there's there's another cabin movie yeah. um cabin in the woods <laughs> that has a very similar premise and a very similar ending right where it's just like no fuck this i'm not gonna if this is what is demanded of us to keep the human race alive then then fuck this world we're out um yeah but the reason why this ending is so fascinating to me is because that's not M night Shyamalan, right? Like this is, you know, we talk about in our deconstructing director series, especially about Shyamalan, we talk about the auteur theory. And this to me is an ending that feels like core to who M night Shyamalan is as a person, right? He, he reads the story. He looks at the story. He looks at the way that story ended and the things that that story was saying. And he says, no, no, no. I, I, I think, I think it's different. I, I think when I see the story, when I see the setup, I see this as people that have been hurt and wounded by the world um, getting an opportunity to save it anyway. Um, and, and then in the end, making that choice, making the choice that that the world is worth saving, even if it costs me my life. Um, yeah. And I don't know that 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 is that that feels like, you know, you look at signs, you look at his whole work that just feels yeah. like essentially M. Night Shyamalan to me. Yeah. I, I was thinking about Lady in the Water where it's. Yeah. Yeah, whole, absolutely. It's all rooted in like faith and having faith in the higher power. And yeah, I, I mean, it's it it really it almost does make sense to me. Like I can almost just swallow it and just be like, sure, per perfectly fine. I, except there's just a few things that bother me, which is like you're saying that it's like God that's doing this. And it's like, well, like that is, this is just evil and fucked up. Like it doesn't, it doesn't seem like, um, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem just. Yeah. And, and then also there's like the, just the creepiness of like the horrifying weapons that they make where it's like, this really seems more like a sort of demonic force is, is, is making them do this. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I think that might be, you know, a kind of a consequence of him taking a story that has a very different tone at the end of it and kind of transforming it into his ultimately optimistic about humanity ending that he puts on it. Right. Those those things might just not mesh in the end. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think there's an interesting question about whether this is, is supposed to be, quote unquote, God or not. Mm -hmm. I think one one thing I really liked, one image that the the movie puts in the very beginning is when is, you know, collecting crickets and putting it in a jar. And she says to the crickets in there, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. I just want to look at you and see what you do for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And essentially, that is what God or whatever this power is, is doing 
to this family, right? Like yeah. we're just putting you in a cabin and we're just going to see what you do. And the, so it, it, it moves it from maybe not necessarily being like the, the Abrahamic God we're talking about, but just a, a, a higher power, a higher force that exists in this world that, that, Fi- that finds it necessary to test humanity every so often. Yeah, some kind of detached demiurge figure. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, and, and also wonderfully uh, uh, parallels also as just being, you know, the audience or the filmmaker. Um, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Watching these these characters struggle and suffer for our amusement. Um, you know, speaking of signs, um, I forget where it was that I saw this. I think it was a YouTube video, but somebody made a really compelling point really compelling argument that the aliens in signs are best viewed as being demons um and they had all kinds of clever lines of evidence for this and i mean obviously within the movie you're supposed to think aliens but actually there's very little concrete evidence in the movie that it is aliens yeah the characters think it's aliens but it it makes a lot of sense for it to be demonic like like literally evil and then that plays of course that actually makes more sense when you think about the fact that that movie is all about faith in god and um you know the the priest is the main character and so forth and that is and so that uh suggests a sort of cosmology or theology where you have god on the one side and satan on the other and and these are two powerful forces that are struggling for you know, uh, dom- uh, d- d- dominion over, over the world. And, and, and so if this is, if, if we can, you know, just for the sake of argument, assume that this is kind of how Shyamalan views the world, mm-hmm. then, then, then maybe that can help resolve some of these gnarly conundrums involving like, well, what does it mean to agree to a sacrifice like this? What does that say about the nature of the world? And it's like, well, it could say that the world is, is sort of this, this thing that is valuable and, and beautiful, but it's in contention between, you know, the good and the bad, and you have to be willing to sacrifice for what's good in the world, yeah, uh, and th- to demonstrate that it does th- that it does have value. Um, I can I can buy that. It's just, I don't know if that's all in the movie, but I can buy that as an idea. Yeah, um, I mean, I, there, I I like this movie a whole bunch um, because it's M Night Shyamalan, and 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 I think it's to me it's like mid tier M Night Shyamalan, um, which is still like better than <laughs> most movies in my estimation. But um, there are parts of it that I'm I'm not in love with. I kind of like I love the idea of these people representing the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse while also simultaneously representing. Um, the, the like the the different aspects of humanity mm-hmm. um, that are that are important and key to all of us. I kind of wish the movie conveyed that information in a way that wasn't just Jonathan Groff saying that verbatim to us. Like I I, I had this like I was watching this movie, and you know when I'm watching movies, knowing I'm doing a podcast on it, I'm always kind of in my head like building what I'm going to say. And one of the things I said, I was going to say is like, Oh, but it's, it's so clear that these people represent different aspects of humanity. And like, it's one of those th- thoughts you have that you think is your original thought um, that you sussed out of the movie yourself. Uh-huh. And, then, and then you watch it and you're like, Oh no, no, no. It just literally says that in the movie. Okay. I can't, I can't say that and then pass that off as me being some kind of genius uh, analyst. Um, the movie just says that. Um, and and I, I, I don't know. Like, I just wish there was a little bit of a more elegant way to to convey that information than just having one of our characters in the final moments just spell that out for us. Sure, I agree with that. I mean, there's there's um definitely this movie has some of Shyamalan's classic kind of cheesiness and campiness. Um, yeah, I mean, nobody also, talks like a human being in a Shyamalan movie. Nobody um, talks like a human being. There's also like the news broadcasts and the way that they're done. It's they're it's so like, fake. Oh my god. They're there's so no fake. effort being made here to make this seem like it was a real thing that was ever on TV. In fact, but isn't goes, that? <laughs> I think I know about what you're going to say. Like, isn't that in, like that could be a choice, right? That could be a choice. You're right. That could be a choice. But if it is a choice, I I think it's like a distracting one, actually. Um, but I don't even think it is a choice, really. I think this is just his sort of. He likes this kind of thing. It, it reminds me of um, the one the, the happening. It reminds the me happening. of some of the stuff yep. from the happening, where mm-hmm. like maybe it's supposed to be funny, but I don't 
uh, yeah, certainly some stuff in the happening is supposed to be funny, but certain, yep. I, I don't think this was supposed to be funny. I don't think there was supposed to be a lot of humor in this movie. Um, no, I don't think so either. So, so doing it that way, I think that's just kind of the way he likes to do things. And, and I don't mind the fact that people don't talk like real people. Um, in fact, I, one thing I wanted to say about this is I have been fairly lukewarm on Dave Batista as an actor. I've, I've never thought that he was bad. I have never been impressed by him. I have always just been like, yep, I recognize Dave Batista," and then, <laughs> and then gone on with the movie. Um, this was the exception where I was like, yeah. This is really solid. He's almost the lead, sort of. And there's a lot of complexity and subtlety. And and this is a very sort of different type of character than his usual kind of typecast yeah. role. And I, I just thought it was great. I thought he he like he kind of stole the show, honestly, um, for me. I, I completely agree. I, I think he is absolutely marvelous in this thing. Like he's he he runs away with the whole movie. And, and I think actually arguably to the movie's detriment, because I think one thing the movie does suffer from a little bit is I don't think we spend enough time with uh, Jonathan Groff and uh, Ben Aldrich's characters, Eric and Andrew, mm -hmm. um, to, to really form an emotional bond with them. Like I, I, I felt much closer to Leonard <laughs> than I did to either of those two characters, which is really fascinating uh, because yeah. I, I like... I don't know, man. I think Dave Bautista, like he kills it with the Shyamalan dialogue, which not every actor can do. Mm -hmm. um, he like, and it's it's perfectly cast too. Because one of the things I love about this movie is it's it's playing with this: are they right or are they not right? Like there there's obviously a kind of a binary choice that is at the core of this entire movie. And I love the ways in which everything isn't quite what it seems. You know, you have this, this enormous hulking muscular man who has such presence and weight on screen. And then he's very well-spoken. He's very gentle, you know, like he's just, it, it is a contradiction. It is something that like the, the first time you meet him, you're immediately made uncomfortable because this huge man walking up to this little girl and having this very formal conversation with her. And I like, I love the use of Batista's tattoos. Like when he mm -hmm. holds out his hand to shake her hand and it's a close up on his hand, there's this heavily tattooed, enormous man talking to this little tiny girl. And yet he's so patient and kind. And it's just like, it, it throws you off. And that's what this movie is really playing with the entire time is you just don't know what to make of any of this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I think his, that's what I mean when I say that, that he, um, he's doing a lot of important subtle stuff because you mm -hmm. can see all of the layers of conflict and and struggle mixed with a, a sort of conviction and certainty knowing that he he knows what he has to do but he hates it you know yeah um, yeah and, and and his interactions with all the other people and like his feelings toward them are really complicated um how he's kind of seemingly become like the de facto leader of their group yeah um, just because of his sort of stolid presence um yeah, very solid. And, and let me tell you, like rewatching this movie was a really interesting experience, too, because, you know, you you kind of clue into a lot of things that I think the movie presents to you, but you don't realize at the time, um, like the 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 reason why Batista is the one that approaches the little girl, which seemingly makes no sense if you have this group of, of four people. Maybe maybe the young woman would be the right one to mm -hmm. to approach the little girl. But the reason it's him is because he's a teacher and he yeah. deals with kids all the time. And so it's the logical choice is I'll go. I'll, I know how to deal with kids out of any, out of the, the best of any of us. So I'm going to go do that um, yeah. is there's a lot of things like that. And then the the one part when when he first hears that that she has two daddies, you know, the look of genuine shock and and kind of horror at it is is like he immediately kind of makes the connection that they're going to immediately assume that this is some sort of hate crime yeah. um it's really because i think the first time you watch the movie you're so uncertain like the the big questions of is this really happening are they crazy or are they correct um and then what are the characters going to do what choices they're going to make those those are so overpowering that you're kind of suspicious of everything and so watching it again, kind of knowing that 
all these people are exactly who they said they were. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you, and just being able to take everything they say at absolute face value, it really becomes a story about those four people and, and yeah. less a story about the, the, the three people, um, at the center of everything. That's interesting. Yeah. I can see that. I can see that unfolding that way because, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, I, just having, having watched it for the first time as we are going through the movie, as we are getting toward the end, the, the, you know, one of the, one of the, the men keeps, uh, introducing doubt, right? He keeps saying like, mm-hmm. they just knew about all this stuff beforehand and now they're just playing us recordings of things that already happened. This is all just a trick. And um, and as far as you know, as the viewer, like that could be the direction we're going with the story. It could all be yeah. a trick. This could be, who who knows, some kind of scam, some kind of twisted, uh, uh, you know, uh, it could be just what he says where it's, it's actually just, they're all just delusional. It's just sort of a shared, a shared delusion. Um, and, and then maybe you could have an ending where, you know, Dave Batista realizes after having already done all these horrible things that he was actually mistaken. And it's like, well, then what did he do? What would he do then? Would he double down on, on the mistake or would he, would he feel remorse? And it's, and, and of course yeah. he doesn't do any of that. It's just, they were actually right the whole time. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, which I think, I guess, I guess from the perspective of like what the film does with his character, I think I like that because he, he is actually just this kind man who it really seems unfair to have given him this task. Like that's what's kind of interestingly, uh, like as, as sadistic as it is to take a family and, and tell them that you have to kill one of the three of you it's another layer of sadistic to basically pick these four random people um, and be like, uh, you, you get, you're going to have these victim, th- these, um, these, these visions inflicted on you. And you're a school teacher. You're just, you're, you're a mom. You're, you're just normal people. And now you are basically damned to have to do this horrible task and die and die in doing it. Like you're, yeah. you're all like, it seemed almost faded that they were all going to die. Yeah. Um, yeah. It seemed like the, the, the whole, the whole part of the ritual is that like they, they're, they were never going to make the decision until they witnessed the death of the four people. Cause that's kind of what, what Jonathan Groff's character says at the end is we had to witness these four examples of humanity before, mm-hmm. before we were able to choose. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It's horrible. It's horribly sad. And that's why like, like I don't want to attach it to, to God as, as, you know the the christian folk know him like this feels much more like i mean it feels old testament god i guess this feels angry and cruel and um you know demanding yeah 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 totally and like the idea that they were chosen because their their love was so pure like this is this this couple that just loves each other absolutely you know like like there's it'd be it'd be one thing if it was a couple that's like going through marriage problems or anything but these are two men that absolutely love each other that adopted this daughter that just just absolutely love her and they're entirely happy together um and that, that these are the people we pick to try to, to try to split and destroy this love up. And I mean, I, in, in the book, that's, that's all to show, to, tr- to start building a case and a point that this is absurd. Um, why would any, why would anyone want to live in a world in which this is what is expected of us? But I mean, th- there is, there is something interesting that I think the movie is doing is, is, you know, at the end when Jonathan Groff makes this decision, he's not really doing it for humanity, Right. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, he's doing it for his daughter. He's mm-hmm. doing it for his husband. And so there is this this shrinking down of the stakes for the characters, at least, to just, you know, I I want I want to see our daughter grow up and be happy and do all the things and and you know, I'm not gonna live to 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 see all that, but I can close my eyes right now and see it. And I don't know, there's there's something very personally relatable to the idea that like if you told me you would have to sacrifice your life to ensure your child gets to live. I'd be like, okay, let's do it. Um, Mm -hmm. No, no, no question at all. Yeah. Framing it that way, I I think made it a little bit more palatable. Um, It was still, I mean, it's interesting that it's, it's kind of such a horrible thing to have to happen that he literally cuts away from it. Um, Mm -hmm. Which I I don't know if, 
I guess that mildly surprised me because I feel like Shyamalan doesn't typically shy away from stuff like that. But I, I, I guess I shouldn't say shy away. It's more like that was just the choice of, of how to how to show the how to frame it, um, how yeah. to frame that event. It's weird that this movie's rated R when mm-hmm. uh, I don't know why. I mean, I guess just like adult themes is the answer because like yeah. there's not a lot of gore. They kind of cut away every time one of the people is is uh, is murdered um yeah they say fuck a bunch of times but i guess they do yeah that's that's yeah, I mean, more than one fuck and that's what you're, you're in our territory i guess maybe just the idea of like showing somebody sitting there and then knowing that there are ice picks going to their head from behind is is uh is is bad um and then there's like the part where he cuts his throat that it shows the blood and everything i don't yeah, really know what the rules the are blood. i don't know yeah, I, I mean, I honestly don't know. Like, maybe that's maybe that's too much. Maybe that. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like PG thirteen is pretty pretty violent, though. So I kind of agree with you that it, it probably didn't need to be R, but maybe maybe Shyamalan wanted it to be R. Maybe he was like, "This is a serious serious movie. This deserves to be R." Um, could be, could be. So one thing I wanted to talk about was just like what a good job the movie does at conveying the horror of the the mundane version of the premise, which is just you're hanging out at a cabin with your family and then a bunch of weirdos show up and (laughs) they want to break in. Like that was like really like that got to me almost more than any other aspect of the movie, because once we start doing fantasy scenarios involving sacrifice, it's like that kind of turns on the part of my brain. That's like, yeah, this is fiction is not real. But the idea of people trying to burst through the door of your cabin and come in through the windows while you're running around pushing couches up against the windows and trying to to figure out what you can use as a makeshift weapon um this was all like that's all the kind of stuff that you can imagine happening to people in real life sure uh, yeah and and i found that very um intense uh, and and just like well done overall i, I agree and, and one of the things that i think's remarkable about this movie is that like I don't know. We've watched a lot of movies. We're pretty genre savvy. We also know M. Night Shyamalan pretty well. We spent a long time with him. I feel like the second the premise of the film is introduced to you, you probably, and maybe I'm speaking for you, but you probably just went, okay, so it's really happening. Like the world is really going to end. Like, mm-hmm. right. Like it's just like the way, the way these kind of things typically go in these types of movies. Yeah. But I think the movie holds that uncertainty for a long time. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that I had kind of already decided, the uncertainty of that situation still really worked on me. And that's why it's, it's such a thrilling film to watch is that because in the back like you're watching this all and 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 you could be watching it just as you said as just the mundane thing that these are four psychopaths that like met up on uh, some message board and cooked up some scheme to just torture some gay people um that certainly like certainly seems plausible especially when you introduce um the the rupert everett character um as the the man who assaulted him in the past that's such a this is a great little you know wrinkle on this whole plot line right Mm -hmm. that that he actually was the guy that assaulted him in in the past that that led him down this road of kind of absolute pessimism towards humanity um that -hmm. that this was the person chosen and it it, it leads you to believe like that once again the god or whatever this entity doing this is really just a piece of shit because of course it chose that guy because that would make that would make it all even the less plausible for these people. Um, yeah. Gotta make it as hard as fucking possible on them. I mean, I think the truth is for me, I went back and forth several times on whether it was real or, or not. Obviously, mm-hmm. you come down on the side of, okay, definitely it's real. There's just, it's just far too much. But yeah, when the, the planes start falling out of the sky, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, even when the planes are flying out of the sky on TV, there's just the tiniest niggling doubt where you're like, this could be faked somehow. But I think by that point, I was probably. I was probably like, okay, yeah, this is probably happening. But I mean, yeah, I think I think the movie does does a good job of like showing you something kind of surprising where you you lean toward it being real, and then and then um, one of the dads has some good argument for how well maybe that doesn't mean what what you thought it meant, and you go back and forth. So it, it really did have. I think I think the movie had me exactly where it wanted me, honestly, which is 
which is kind of the thing with Shyamalan. Like, like he's good at a lot of things. Maybe there are some things that he's not as good at. But what, I think like the thing that he's the best at is kind of keeping you in the pocket dramatically where he wants yeah. you and, and move, moving you around and knowing exactly where your head's at and what you're thinking. I'm, I'm saying this mainly from like a writer, a, a writer's perspective because he's, mm-hmm. he's the writer, right? That's the, that's why we love him is he's, he's a writer director and, and on the writing level, he knows exactly how to push and pull you around with, with the, the narrative choices that he's making. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, yeah, it's 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 really remarkable how he does it. And I mean, I, I want to stay on this for a little bit, but I just want to make a note here that we can't we can't leave talking about this movie with, without talking about the camera work he's doing on it, which I think yeah. is just some top tier Shyamalan for sure. Like nobody shoots movies like this guy and I love it to death, but um, we, can, we can get that to that in a bit because I did. I wanted to talk a little bit about. Th- that um rupert everett um what was his character's name why rupert grint why do i keep saying everett rupert grint the 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 redmond character um, wait was that really rupert grint yeah that was rupert that was grint ron weasley american accent yeah <laughs> shaman yeah, loves it. him he was in servant too oh cool okay yeah. so i thought that looked exactly like rupert grint but i was like no it can't <laughs> be it can't be rupert grint because he has a perfect american accent so it's obviously just some american guy <laughs> actors can't do voices no um, they can't do that that's so that's that's awesome i'm glad you, i'm glad to now know that was rupert grunt because <laughs> he mm-hmm. did, he was amazing he was he was yeah. great especially was his great. death scene holy shit that oh was incredible God. yeah uh, yeah okay. it, it's also great and like i i love i love the wrinkle of him being introduced and and one one more thing that you know watching this movie again when none of the other characters knew about his connection to these people. Right. And I guess, and he kind of has to realize it in real time as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the thing that I loved about it was it, they say, Oh, you know, Andrew says, Oh, this is the guy, this is the guy that, that beat me up all those years ago. And all of the other people, you know, Sabrina and Adrian, the other, the, the two women of the group, like are immediately like, what? And, and they show just, just a little bit of doubt, right? Like it just cracks their facade just a little bit to where they're like, well, wait a minute here. Wait, 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 mm-hmm. wait a minute. Like, yeah. that's a weird coincidence. Um, wasn't it this guy, wasn't it Redmond that picked, that said the, that dreamed about the cabin first? Wasn't it like... And, and and it's that's such a really interesting wrinkle because it it allows it to do what you were talking about where you just buy into the fact that oh maybe this is all fake for just a little bit because you see these people suddenly have this moment of of real doubt where they're like oh my god and and then like Leonard is kind of very quick to put them back in line because he seems to be the one that is just the most out of anyone like the most committed to this thing um and and so that like that again another interpretation of that is just the cult leader reining his cult back in when right when, uh something is exposed to them yeah that was the one moment actually where like he's so quick to shut it down mm-hmm. that i was like hmm, maybe he's not as on the level as he seems to be um but again i think that was an intentional you know uh, uh juke yeah. to try to to try to make you think like in that direction. Um, but actually, yeah. you know, from his point of view, he's just like, no, we're not letting ourselves get distracted by these doubts. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I, I get, yeah, I don't have anything to say about this uh, other than like, I guess the, I guess I do want to say like just the, the action directing was, was really good. And that's not something that I've ever really thought like Shyamalan is a great action director. It's like, well, no. Yeah. I, I in fact, in fact, I will say that I've never thought that because in in the movies, in in his superhero movies, I always kind of felt like it was kind of weird. It's kind of weirdly done. Yeah. Um, I mean, his his three worst movies are the three that have the most amount of action in mm-hmm. them. So But this was yeah. really good. Like I I really thought the scene where um Batista is in the shower behind the shower curtain. Oh. First of all, that's just an excellent scene from a tension point of view. And then, like the way he just like bursts out of the shower, like a 
like a tiger um, yeah. and just beats the shit out of them in like two seconds. It was just like really viscerally well executed action filmmaking and, and like very, very like quick too. It's yeah. not, not indulgent. Just, just I thought it was really good. That is a, that is to me like a vintage Shyamalan scene because mm-hmm. it, the way everything plays out, the way the camera focuses on stuff just long enough, like he walks into the room the door opens and like the, the the character kind of gets out of the way of the camera as the door opens. So we get this full look at the bathroom and we see the broken circle window in the back of the bathroom. And there's this immediate thought of like, Oh, he got out the window mm-hmm. immediately followed by that huge guy got through that little window. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and so you're just not sure. And then he goes to the shower curtain and, you know, so many movies have done the, you know, pull back the shower curtain, build suspense and release it moment. Oh, he's not there. He fires, he fires the bullet in and the camera is allowed to linger just long enough for you, the viewer, to attempt to look through the bullet hole uh-huh. in the shower curtain to see if you can see anything behind there. Uh-huh. It's just, it's masterful. It's so good. Yeah. No, and and also just plot wise, the element of having the the, the gun I thought was very, very clever because it's like... Mm-hmm. It's like okay, totally believable that that this guy would bring the gun with him, but he would leave it locked up in the safe in the car and unloaded because mm-hmm. cause you want to have the security of the gun, but you don't really think anything's going to happen, so you're not going to keep it loaded, you're not going to keep it on you. Very, very realistic sort of sort of choice for a person to make. And then when he goes for the gun, he's actively being stabbed in the leg while he's trying to frantically load bullets yeah. into the magazine, and so he gets. And, and I don't even think we clearly see, like, does he get three? Does he get four? How many bullets are in that magazine? Mm-hmm. And and so you have a gun that has a very, you know, he fires one bullet immediately at the woman. And then, so we just have so few bullets in this gun that it's it's just an excellent, you know, so so he shoots through, this, through the shower curtain. The reason I bring this up now is because it's like, well, if that were me, I would just, like, shoot the shower, like, eight times. Yeah. Um, um, but he he doesn't have that many bullets there's basically no instances in this movie where i was like ah oh, that idiot you know <laughs> it, it's it's always like yes that is that is what a person either should do or at least at least realistically would do in that situation yeah yeah um yeah no i i i totally agree with that um and i mean it's it's like the, the, just the the way that tension is maintained, the way the camera shows and doesn't show stuff like the, the he, he gets really hurt and he shoots her. He shoots through the car and then he shoots her. It's all it's all just so it, it just so wonderfully escalates all this tension mm-hmm. so well. Like I, yeah. this is the thing the movie did. Like even if, if we can have conversations about the ending and how the ending did or didn't work, I just think the filmmaking on display here is just him at the top of his game really honestly yeah 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 no i mean it's funny because i think you're basically right about me like i wouldn't have ended the movie that way but Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna say like i didn't like it or like it's it's it worked it worked for what it was yeah it's one of those premises where where you you walk away from the movie thinking of all the different ways it could have been you know sure um, and that that to me is a cool idea for a premise. Yeah, I think I think my biggest worry here was it was going to ha- kind of have the Benjamin Button effect on you where <laughs> the 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 choices in the movie were so out of line of what you would consider reasonable <laughs> choices made that it would just kind of destroy the entire film for you. Um, um no, because because the way like if you get into the point of view of the characters, I feel like. That's one thing the movie's good at is it really emphasizes how shockingly horrifying the situation is and and like this is not this is not us you know sitting in our armchairs talking about philosophy and talking about utilitarianism mm-hmm. and and you know going over the finer points of Abrahamic religion this is this is an emergency this is a f- mm-hmm. this is a horrifying horrible emergency that's happening to you right now and the stakes are are so high that you and you're you're basically in shock 
And so because of all of that, I could basically have, I could have bought any decision that the characters made because sure. I would have just been like, yeah, it's a, it's a horrible situation. Um, like, like it, it's a, it's a, it's a deeply, <laughs> deeply fucked situation. Um, and, and, and so I, I could have gone along with it. Um, the thing about the Benjamin Button situation is that it was just like, it, it was just like him, him making a, a very calm decision where I was like, I, I, that's a, I could never make that decision, you know? Yeah, so, that's um, fair. I, I guess I, th I thought your critique would be less about like, was, was the character's decision in the moment believable and more, um, the movie kind of declaring that as the correct decision mm -hmm. is is passing uh, not judgment but is making a, a message about you know what 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 the correct thing to do in this situation would be mm -hmm. and i thought um, you would brush up against that pretty hard yeah i mean I, I i agree that i wouldn't have made the same decision as the characters probably yeah and Maybe. you probably wouldn't make a story in which in which the the resolution is actually it's a good thing to kill yourself for the sake of humanity when some jealous monstrous uh, deity demands that you do it. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that's that's pretty much. I, I guess I guess you could say it's a testament to the quality of just the storytelling that, despite disagreeing with the moral, I was just like <laughs> along for the ride anyway. Because you're totally sure. right. I mean, everything you just said is correct. I just. It doesn't particularly bother me. <laughs> yeah, so. no, that's good. I, I think that is a testament to the the, the skills on display here. Mm -hmm. I think one thing I did want to talk about is Shyamalan's use of close-ups in this movie, um, mm -hmm. which he does a lot, probably more so than just about any film I've seen him do. Um, I joked at, at, at you before recording that this is this is called uh, Knock at the Cabin, aka uh, the movie Shyamalan made after he got a book on close-ups. Um, but of course, but of course, I think it, it's it's a very it's a very targeted choice here in that this is a very intimate movie which has a lot of characters in a lot of very small spaces having to make very high pressure emotional decisions, and so the movie really likes to sit on their faces a lot, like. <laughs> can't believe I just said sit on their faces. <laughs> uh, the movie likes to has to have the camera stay on their faces a lot um, in, in these really close ups. And I think this is one of those things that kind of demands quality acting. Um, you know, like you're, you're kind of, when you're in the close up for this long, you're laying it out, out to bear it. And it's, it's part of the reason why I was so impressed with Dave Bautista because he has to do a lot of stuff with his face where the camera is very close to his face and he's, he's got, he, he's got to sell it in these moments because this is all we can see. All we can see is what his face is doing in these moments. And man, he does such a good job with it. They all, yeah. they all do. Everyone in this movie does such a good job with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Every, literally every every character, um, and, and which is you know, there's sometimes there's kind of some weird, inhuman behavior in Shyamalan movies, and mm -hmm. and I don't really think there was any of that here. I think that everybody was behaving in a believable way that you could take some person and put yeah. them under extreme duress, and um, yeah, just some really great like the the Rupert Grint death scene again. I, I was like, this is extremely intense this is really this is really something um, that's really fascinating one too because we don't really know that guy like yeah. he's the first one that dies we we get to learn the least about him and the th the stuff we know is that you know he, he was a homophobe that smashed a, a beer bottle over a, a gay man just because they were in love at a bar um right. and yet like when he kneels down and like puts the thing over his face and like the moment of i'm scared like is so powerfully emotional that like yeah. it it's so well executed like Rupert Grint good actor folks yeah. not just Ron Weasley really good yeah. actor actually yeah yeah I, I I always thought he was fun in Harry Potter too for that matter but yeah like yeah. his like don't don't look away from me thing just really got to me for some reason that's yeah. one thing I should say is like we're, sometimes we sometimes we get into the technical weeds or or, or talk about like well, that that worked really well and that's fine but like this movie was emotionally affecting mm -hmm. this really mm -hmm. made me sad actually um several times um like for several different reasons and i ended yeah. it like like when the movie ended i was very i was like 
I was like sad and like somber and like I didn't you know often when I finish a movie I'll like quickly text you and, and like we'll start having a conversation about it and I just like I didn't really want to talk <laughs> I was like yeah I was yeah. like sad and and I kind of just wanted to to sit with that for a while um mm -hmm. and then you know the, thus we didn't really talk about the movie uh, in, until now but um yeah it was, yeah I, I, I I thought it was successful as as a drama not just a thriller I agree. I agree. Totally. Um, as a complete non sequitur, <laughs> is it wild to you that of the three uh, Harry Potter people that uh, I, I'm like, I, I'm most interested in what Rupert Grint is doing? Uh, it, that is interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, if you had asked me before this, I would have said, oh, Rupert Grint is still acting. Um, but while yeah. we've been talking, I've been looking at his um, Wikipedia, and he has he has been um, he has been acting. So well, it, good good for him. Yeah, I mean, it's like you, you have these three children, and they all make so much money off of these eight movies that they never ever have to work again, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yet they've all continued to have careers. And like five ten years ago well i don't know five years ago i would have said emma watson has had the most success out of the three of these people right she's done the biggest movies right she's done she did a freaking uh, beauty and the beast right mm -hmm. but i don't i'm more fascinated by what radcliffe and and uh rupert are doing actually because, yeah because they're they're both do, like because basically all three of these people are in this 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 place where they never have to worry about money again every single thing they are in is a thing that they're doing just by choice that they're just like this is a really interesting project that i want to get involved in yeah and and that's it and i don't know it's just that they do really really small interesting interesting things like like rupert grant being in in servant this tiny little Shyamalan apple tv show that i don't think anybody but me watched is just really fascinating sure no, I mean, I, I always, I always thought it was cool that, um, Harry Potter, whose name I'm blanking on right now, um, Daniel was, Radcliffe, Daniel Radcliffe was in so many weird, you know, indie kind of edgy, strange, bizarre things that ended up being widely loved by the, um, you know, the, the, the more, you know, the more cultured films, f f film viewer set, um, mm -hmm. And and now it seems that Rupert Grant was also doing the same thing, just maybe a little bit lower profile. Yeah. Um, so so that's great. I'm I'm excited about about this. I I kind of want to rewatch the movie now, knowing that it was Rupert Grant. I'm I'm like twice as impressed <laughs> because there because it wasn't until like a particular shot, maybe even literally his death scene, which would have been the last shot where. It's the first time he really is in the center of the frame. He's kind of the center of the of of of, of the of what's happening, and you get a really really clean look at his face, and he's got the beard and everything. So it's and I was like, what what? That's not is that? Um, and then I, I didn't follow up on it. So like anyway, I had no idea. Um, like that that's how much he disappeared into <laughs> that's the character because he's like this twitchy, angry guy. Yeah. And his voice is totally, totally different. There's, there was just not a molecule of of Ron Weasley uh, on display there. So that was just I love pretty, this. Pretty cool. I love this. <laughs> like, because imagine, like, cause there's not a lot of actors who who I who I've watched for eight movies who I wouldn't recognize. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so sure, yeah, I think he's he's transformed the most from his uh, from his Harry Potter days for mm -hmm. sure. I guess the one I'll, I'll give myself is that he was basically a kid before and now he's yeah. like a man in his thirties and that there's going to be, some I just, I if, let, let the record show that I immediately recognized him as Rupert Grant, like from the first second I saw him on screen, oh, okay. there was never any, any doubt to that mm. at all. Very well. <laughs> but, uh, but to be fair, I had also seen Rupert Grant in a, uh, in servant, um, which is, you know, was filmed like at about the same time. So. All right. There you go. See, I'm not a total idiot. <laughs> um, okay. So I think we're, we're wrapping up. I, I think one thing I did just want to say is, you know, I, I, I critiqued this movie for its um, tell don't show bit a little bit, but I did want to kind of highlight what I thought was a really beautiful moment of storytelling at the end. Just very simple, not too complicated, but the moment where 
uh, they've they've saved the world already, and A- Andrew and Wen are getting into the car together and driving off. And uh, the song that we saw earlier in the movie, the three of them sing along to, uh, comes on the radio. And there's this really wonderful beat of the radio turns on, he turns it off. Uh, when a bit later turns it back on, listens it to it for a little bit, and then she turns it off. And then there's this pause again. And, and then Andrew decides to turn it back on um, mm-hmm. and leave it on. And it's this, this beautiful moment of storytelling, you know, where, where so much is said in that moment, but not said. You know, yeah. we're like, he's depressed and angry at the world um, and just wants to get away from this. She resists that at first, but then succumbs to the sadness as well. And then he looks at this and says, no, I have for her sake, like we have to be able to to move on from this and and face it and and then turns on the song again and embracing it. And it's just like this this little bit of storytelling in this just one moment of people turning on and off a radio that I just love to death. Yeah, it gives you it does it does give you a little bit of of warmth at the end there because mm-hmm. you realize that sort of the the vision um that the that the other husband had is a possibility. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because because like you said, he's he's in shock for all kinds of reasons. He's in shock because he just went through this dramatic experience. He's in shock because he just had to kill his husband. He's in shock because apparently uh God is real and he is a vengeful god. Um and he <laughs> yeah. and he has just learned this. Um, and, and you can see on his face that he's just reeling and, mm-hmm. and then, and then you can also see the moment when he's like, it's not like it's better, but he realizes, okay, I need to be here for her now. Yeah. And so he kind of pulls himself together a little bit and, and that's, you know, I think that's when he turns on the, the music for the last time and and yep. then and they drive away. And and I think it's so important that that happens, right? Because like, if you're looking at this from a writer's perspective, you have this moment, but you've established this character as a guy who went through this traumatic event a few years ago, and his reaction to it was to get angry, was to to kind of turn his back on the world, was to you know buy a gun and just be in this co- constant state of anger and fear and pessimism, and um, that that you know his his husband is such a, an opposite of him in that way and i kind of love how those two guys are characterized and so like from a writer's perspective you're like okay great we set him up this way which worked really well for the conflict but like i'm worried there's a fear in the viewer's eyes that this event will will have the same effect on him actually and mm-hmm. it will destroy him utterly and then this beautiful image of him and his daughter all grown up um that his husband had in his last moments will be erased and so it's like okay so we have to have just a quick moment where we say no it's going to be okay and so we have to have that moment where you know he he collects himself a little bit and it's how do we do that how do we how do we communicate that things are going to be okay and it's such a wonderful idea here i don't know whose idea this was i don't know if this was Shyamalan's or someone else but it's just because you know it wasn't in the book right because this is a different ending so yeah it's just a wonderful little idea here to to just to just communicate to the audience no no things are going to be okay with these not with the world but with these two specifically Mm mm-hmm yeah, no. I mean, honestly, to me, that's that's like Shyamalan at his best is this sort mm-hmm. of nonverbal, um, visual storytelling. I, yeah, it, these are some of my favorite moments of of his movies. Are things where it's really all about what what you're seeing and nobody's mm-hmm. even talking. Um, it it reminded me so much of yeah the the final moment in the Sixth Sense, my favorite Shyamalan film. Yeah. Um, with the, the mother and son talking in that, that moment that. between them in the car. I mean, also, also in a car, Shyamalan likes uh, parent child, big moments in cars or at kitchen tables. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, while they are saying things in that scene, they're not really saying much. It's, yeah. it's in mm-hmm. the reactions mm-hmm. and the performances, uh, you know, overall. Um, Absolutely. Yep. So good movie, really good movie. Mm-hmm. I'm glad I'm glad you liked it as well. Yeah. Um since this is technically um a a movie that belongs to a, a director that we've done on our deconstructing series, did you want to attempt to slot this into our current Shyamalan ranking? Sure, why not? 
All right. So for those that don't know, uh, here is our current ranking of Shyamalan films from worst to best. At number 12, we have The Last Airbender, then After Earth, Glass, Lady in the Water, The Happening, The Visit, Old, The Village, Split, Unbreakable, Signs, and The Sixth Sense. So, you know, looking at this list, I feel like it can't go higher than four. It's so funny to me because I already don't agree with our past selves, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> I was surprised to see glass so far down the list, honestly. I, I up think the what, list. What is the expression? I always do that wrong. I, I think, I think down the list. No, I think what happened probably though is that I hated it and you liked it a lot, and our compromise yeah. was to put it at number ten. Um, that, yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Oh. So what what about this list that you're seeing that is from when we did old a year ago or got a year I, and a half I, I ago? I think it's yeah, I think it's literally just that I like the village a lot. And so seeing it below seeing it at number five is surprising to me. But I probably I probably obviously I agree to this. Well, whatever. No, I agree with you though, that that I don't really think this is better than top four or five of these. I would definitely mm-hmm. say it's better than it belongs above number six. I'll say I'll say it that way. Four, four, five, or six, something, something in that range. Mm-hmm. So better than old is what you're saying. Basically, better than old. I think I did like old, but I think even at the time I wasn't raving at it and saying it was just you know the best ever. I, I think it was it was pretty good, but it wasn't one of his best films. I mean, I I love old for being like campy absurd Shyamalan embracing campy absurd Shyamalan in the same way that I love the happening right sure. where I mean there's a there's a rapper in old named like minivan or something ridiculous yeah like the the Shyamalan absurd dialogue is at its all-time high in in old yeah and and part of me is always like you know everyone makes fun of this but I really think he's doing it on purpose and it is such a different movie from this movie which is not really diving into that that kind of campy absurdity that old is and i have a i I have a special place in my heart for that version of Shyamalan for sure Sure. but yeah Yeah. i do kind of think this is a better movie overall than that movie yeah yeah i mean i think that movie like the 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 best thing about it is also the worst thing about it which is that it it has this extremely bizarre premise and but then but then which which makes it harder for it to work Mm-hmm. But then he, but then he just, he just is totally unapologetic with his weird yeah. premise. <laughs> I um, love it so much. I need to rewatch old. God, I love that movie. So, but I, I do think this is better than old. I, I don't know if it's better than the village or not. I I think my, my, my feelings toward the village are, are kind of irrational. I mean, no, I think it's probably, go ahead. I mean, I just like the v- reason for the village is five and split is four is because I really, really love split and you really, really love the village. Yeah. And I, we probably I'm, I'm guessing what the conversation was, is you made me put glass at number 10. So you have to give me this. Yeah. And I also had to give you unbreakable possibly. Um, possibly. Yeah. Um, although my recollection was that I, I thought I didn't like unbreakable until we rewatched it for the show. And then yeah. I liked it a lot more. Um I mean, like my, I think my three, two, and one are the same, but I think they'd be in a different order. Like I would, mm-hmm. I would shift signs and unbreakable. Um, mm-hmm. So that was probably my compromise to you. Mm-hmm. This well, is all this list thing is about is compromises. So yeah, I mean, I think around the village, I think the decision is, is just, is it better than the village or worse than the village? Um, yeah. And, and I, I don't know. I mean, I kind of still feel like I like the village better. Um, I think the village is just a, just a wonderfully done movie. Um, yeah. It's so like part, part of me, uh, part of this is also like the village is so maligned by a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And so I want to be more defensive of it and I want to like lift it up even further because I, I think it's really good actually. I agree. I mean, I, I think, I think I'll, I'll just, I'll just agree with you and, and put the village above this movie because, you know, maybe this movie is like technically better in some filmmaking sense but just man, the village has Joaquin Phoenix. So yeah, that that's you know, an automatic bump there. It's an automatic bump, and and Bryce Dallas Howard and like seventeen other people who are great. Yeah. So um, yeah, and they're all yeah, doing. Yeah. Okay. Great job. So 
So. so there we go. We put Knock at the Cabin at the same spot we put Old at last time, which was right in the middle of the list at number six. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's pretty good, though. Like, I, I think I think that the cool thing is, like, it seems like our top five is like a lock and you're going to have to do something like super amazing, blow us away to ever break into the top five. But in the last two years, the two movies he's made have been right on the cusp of that, Mm -hmm. which is really fucking cool. Actually. It is. It's great. And I, I fully recognize that my love for the village for signs and for the sixth sense is somewhat rooted in nostalgia and, um, maybe, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. knock at the cabin is better than the village. Maybe I'm biased, but that's fine. This is our list, whatever. Yeah. I like it. I'm happy with it. Um, everything everything looks good here. I can't wait to see what M Night Shyamalan does more. This is this is the thing that remains true. You know, even when even when I don't love his movies, um, they're just so fascinating. They're always original. And I mean, this technically wasn't an original story. It was based off of a novel. But no one no one is making movies like M Night Shyamalan is making movies. And I, I do think it's so weird how maligned he is whenever a new movie comes out. People are like ready to pounce on it um, when he is just continuing to do different original fun things. I don't know. Yeah. I've installed a little module in my brain that uh, blanks people out and turns them into kind of a gray void whenever they start saying bad things about M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> I love it. You should try it. Um, um, I just get so defensive. Like I, it's so weird because like I, I've, I've matured to a place in my life where it's like, I don't care if people don't like things I like because I'm a 37 year old adult who doesn't need everyone to like the things that I like. And then I hear people talking shit about M. Night Shyamalan and I'll be like, Hey, listen, you yeah. shut the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah, leave him alone. Leave Knight alone. Yeah, he um, he needs our support. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He's doing great. He's doing fantastic. Um, yeah. Somebody and maybe we already talked about this at some point, but somebody on Twitter was was pointing out like people will say, "Man, why, why do they keep giving Shyamalan money to make movies?" And it's like they they don't. They haven't. Yeah. Been. <laughs> he finances all of his own movies, and they all make money because uh-huh. he's good at this. Shut the yes. fuck up. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, we'll see what he does next. Um, I was just looking at his IMDb, seeing if if anything has been announced. Um, I see uh, in twenty twenty four we're getting untitled M Night Shyamalan project. So I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> he's been like really supportive. Um, uh, he's got got a nepo baby. His daughter is in the business as well, and um, he's been really supportive of her. I think he's allowed her to allowed her that's probably the wrong phrase but she she wrote and directed on several episodes of servant and it seems like there's another movie coming out in 2024 called the watchers that stars dakota fanning that she wrote and and directed and he's producing it so i wonder i don't know there's a shana Shyamalan coming up i need to see if she's like her dad or how is she different i think it's gonna be really really interesting yeah yeah i i'm i'm curious Mm mm-hmm all right that is m night Shyamalan. we will of course revisit him when the next film does eventually come out and maybe one day you'll watch servant and uh and maybe you can explain to me what the fuck was happening in that show because i finished it i watched it all still don't know sounds good do 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 all right matt a couple weeks ago we watched the movie being there for our doof canon episode and we both really really liked it but we put the vote up to our patrons to see if it was good enough to be entered into the canon. And as expected, Matt, I think this was the lowest vote turnout uh, we've ever had. Um, Uh I think we had a a grand total of five votes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. No, there were, there were eight. There were eight. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Better than I expected. Yeah. Um, with a score of 88 to 13 percent, although that math doesn't quite add up, so I don't know how that <laughs> works. Uh, yes, being there was voted into the canon. We had so- several people uh, visit it for the first time, like we did. Uh, several people that voted uh, 
lo- loved this movie for a long, long time. Um, and it was good enough. It was good enough to get into the canon. So uh, that makes me really happy, actually. Uh, a movie, whenever we put in a movie that like probably or maybe wouldn't appear on on your typical best of list, it makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm glad that I finally got the opportunity to watch that one. Um, I guess it was better than I even thought it would be. I think it's going to stay with me. It's very funny. Me too. Still recommend it, even maybe for those of you who were listening who who were like, I don't know what that is, or that <laughs> sounds like a boring old movie. Um, it, it's quite delightful. I really enjoyed it. I do too. I love revisiting the 70s in film. It's such a fascinating decade to watch. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to our final topic of the week. The Writers Guild is on strike. No more writing. This whole episode, Matt, no one wrote it for us. Yeah. Because they're they're all on strike. Yeah, and, and I stand in solidarity by continuing to not write any fiction. <laughs> so brave of you. Thank you. No, so I, I, we mentioned at the, the top of the show that this is all um, really, really complicated uh, the last time the Writers Guild went on strike was in 2007, 2008. I think that strike lasted for about 100 days. Um, a, a lot of what that one was about was getting a handle on the internet and how um, how like pay structures and all this stuff was going to happen in this new, at the time, very new world of online streaming. Um, 15 years later, a lot has changed in both entertainment and in the industry and um, the writers are are not getting paid what they want, and so they've gone on strike. The uh, this is so complicated, Matt. So I want to want to try to do this justice as much as possible. Um, there's a lot of things that are being asked for here, and a lot of the like the number things, like what percentage of what should should go to the writer, like that kind of number stuff, is something that that the studios and the writers were very close on. The things that they weren't quite as close on was some of like the the ever changing landscape of how entertainment is consumed and the ways in which writers are compensated for their part in that. Um, so one of one of the big asks from the guild was around um, getting residual compensation based on viewer on streaming services um, because basically. You know, back in the olden days of television, a TV show would would, if it was successful, would be on a lot, would get would get renewed a lot, would eventually get up to a uh, hundred episodes, and then it would get syndicated, and that means they would package it and sell it to other networks. And in those syndication deals, residuals were paid to the writers that wrote on those shows every time that show played on any network anywhere. Uh, someone that wrote on that show got residuals and that was enough to keep a writer going, you know, like, I I don't think you could, you could make, you know, enough to just sit on your ass and just rake in residuals unless the show was like hugely popular, but that has gone away now, basically. Um, their syndication isn't a thing anymore, um, because everyone has their own streaming service. And so they just play on the streaming service over and over again. And so they they wanted to talk about that. And one of the things with talking about that is, okay, what is a view, right? What what is what is a download? Um, how are we defining these metrics on how many how, what people are watching and how much of it they're watching? And all these things that you and I have talked about in the past, the streaming services have kept very very under wraps. Like Netflix will come out and say, blah 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 is the most watched show on our service this week but they don't say what that means numerically. They just say it um, and they don't have to tell anyone about it. And so part of this, this ask is you have to start making this information public. Um, and it doesn't seem like the streaming services want to do that. So that is one place that they're at a, at a complete impasse. Yeah. I mean, we frequently talk on this show about the idea that we we kind of suspect that it's all a Ponzi scheme of some kind, <laughs> and and like yeah, and, and and like if if people really knew what the numbers were in the first place, then it would be clear that none of this makes any sense. Yeah, um, and that like this thing is subsidizing that thing is subsidizing this other thing, and it's all this elaborate shell game of creative accounting. Um, I don't know if this is true, obviously, but it doesn't. 
at all surprise me to hear that the that these companies would be extremely resistant to the idea of mm -hmm. making their numbers public. Um, at the very minimum, what that does is is it immediately gives organizations like the Writers Guild a huge source of leverage for negotiating, which is something mm -hmm. these companies don't want. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's like the minimum harm that it does the company so and, and the writer's perspective on this whole thing is all these studios uh, and streaming services are going to ad-based revenue models mm -hmm. currently like netflix introduced theirs last year a lot of the other ones are following suit and their their argument is if you're going to do a revenue an ad-based revenue model you're going to have to make your your numbers public eventually anyway and then someone would reply oh well no you just have the studio just privately give those numbers to the ad companies um, and not have to release them publicly. And, and you're like, yeah, but if like, that was the way, like if that's the way it worked, then that, that would be the way it would have worked. Like from the beginning of TV, right? Yeah. Like it, it if, if that was a, an actual model that would function, then they would have done that. The second commercial started existing on television. Yeah. No, that, I mean, it, that's not what a market is. Like, yeah. Like, like if, yeah. If I'm like Scott, I want to sell you something. It's in this box, and you're like, "Oh, okay." Like, what is it? And I'm like, "It's five dollars." And you're <laughs> like, "But what's in the box?" Oh, I can't. You know, can't tell you. Yeah. Part part of having those numbers reliable is that those numbers are auditable, and if you yeah. just keep them to yourself, but then whisper them to the the marketer. Uh, and, and, sure. Yeah, and then and then like then Coca Cola and Pepsi can sort of bid on what they think that slot is worth whereas if you don't if you don't give an opportunity for like competitive pricing then you're just making up a yeah. price yeah which is not favorable to the advertiser so one of the the other really interesting things that they asked for in this agreement that the studios like rejected out of hand is they they kind of introduced at the last minute a, a clause about ai and the use of ai in writing um mm -hmm. And they basically said that they wanted to introduce a rule that that AI would not be used in storytelling, um, that that they would not be creating stories through that, that they would still be. I mean, obviously, this is a, a very fair ask of a writer's guild, right? Don't replace us. And they kind of expected they, they, they kind of thought it would be like a softball thing. that The studio wouldn't, you know, not grant in in whole but at least come back with like a proposal that like we can we can try to figure out this whole ai thing and what it's going to be the studio basically said absolutely not the one stipulation we'll have for you is we can meet once a year to talk about the changing landscape of technology in our industry yeah <laughs> and the right I mean, to the writers that was like oh fuck oh th we expected them to just go along with this fine. And so that scared them into being like, Oh, they're, they're planning on introducing AI stuff into, into the, the, the writer section of this whole thing. I think these writers need to read more science fiction. Like the, the, the idea that there's not going to be any, what does that even mean? Like everything is going to have AI in it. Everything is going to have AI in it. <laughs> Three years. Yeah. From I mean, now, I think everything. they just want, they like, here's, here's the, the bottom line of this whole thing is, this from from a writer's perspective the studios have been trying to do to professional narrative storytelling writers what the journalism industry has already done to journalists which is you know you don't it's it's more of a gig economy um the like the industry journalism industry has just absolutely collapsed you know and a lot of these studios would absolutely love to just be able to pay people like in gigs and they can't do that under the current agreements and they've been chipping away over time at at, at the right the writers guild protection of their inability to do that and so this is the writer saying no 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 like we this is a career these are jobs we want to be treated like employees and not just gigs um that's like the main overlying thing of this whole thing mm -hmm. yeah um I mean, it's very much understandable, right? I mean, it, it mm -hmm. seems it seems like the world has gotten worse for the shift that happened in in the journalism industry because, yeah, mm -hmm. because now basically, you know, the the uh, the career journalist who would go after the tough scoops is sort of not even a thing anymore. Yeah, like there there are no staff positions for those people, um, and and it would be pretty 
it, it strikes me that it would be bad for everyone if we just yeah. stopped having people whose job was, oh, I'm a writer. I I I write for, you know, TV because it would it yeah. would it would worsen what is already a very badly skewed sort of Pareto distribution industry where, yeah. really already for the history of you know Hollywood and the publishing industry, very few people actually make a living writing. Mm -hmm. There are some mega whales who make a very good living, but there are like six of those people. Um, and then, and then there's like a long tail of people who, who try and, and aren't successful. And this sort of thing would just make that even worse. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's already like, it's already bad right now. And mm -hmm. it, like, um, like the, the anecdote I heard is that one of the, the writers for the show, the bear, um, which was a very popular show that made Hulu just a theoretically gobs of money. I agree with you that we don't, we do, that the economics of this thing is so weird, but he had a, a negative bank account that he was like living paycheck to paycheck and barely surviving. And he wrote for one of the biggest shows of the year last year. So like mm -hmm. that feels like that shouldn't be the case. And they've been doing a lot of tricky things. So like there's a thing I'm going to get really complicated with industry stuff that I just learned about this week. So bear with me here, but there's a thing that's been happening called a mini room, which is not a writer's room. So the, the thing that with, with traditional television model, you know, you put together a writer's room and these are, these are staff writers who are working on your show for the length of the season. And so they are there writing the episodes as the episodes are being produced. They are there making edits and changes to the episodes as filming is happening. And as even as, you know, um, post-production is happening, you know, if, if we're going through some edits and realize, oh, we need a pickup there. Well, someone's got to write what the dialogue of that pickup is. That is what a writer's room is. That is what a writer's room does. And these writers get paid throughout that process. A mini room is getting a group of writers together. They break six scripts for a six episode television series. And then you say, okay, thanks. Bye. And you just move on and do everything else without them. And um, the writer's guild does not like this. And the part of the reason why the writer's guild doesn't like this is because there was this unwritten standard or practice in writing that when you would negotiate with a writer to be in the writer's room, you would pay them the minimum salary the union dictates, the WGA dictates, there's a WGA minimum. You would pay them that minimum, but but they would make most of their money, or at least a, a significant part of their money, above that minimum from producer level credit that is happening during production of the thing because the writer is still doing stuff during production. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when, when deals were negotiated, when the minimum was negotiated, it was done so with this unwritten understanding that they would also typically get a producer credit on it. And that producer credit with through the PGA would come with a certain amount that, that they're required to be paid. And that's how the structure worked. And that's how people made their living is this understanding. And that has gone away. And so one of the things the writers guild is asking to do is just codify into actual rule, the thing that was already being done. Um, mm. And it's, it's really like, this is really complex shit. It really is. Yeah. There's so many different like ways in which all this plays out. There's the laws and the rules, but it's just all, yeah. it's just all weird. Well, it's, yeah, it seems, it seems very amorphous and difficult to really get the credit that's due to you in, in this industry yeah. where it's by its very nature, so extremely collaborative. Um, you know, it's very little of the job actually looks like, turning in a script and they say, thank you, here's a check for that script. Like that is one type of job of being a writer, but it sounds like a lot of people make even more money doing the thing that you're describing. Um, yeah. Which, which again is very hard to, to sort of, which quantify. is still like, it's still writing and it's still like the yeah. job that they've been hired to do. It's just the way you structure it and the way you organize it. And I mean, these companies really, they, they have spent the last decade trying to skirt the rules as much as possible sure. as of course a company is going to do you know they're trying to lower their costs that's what they're trying to do um it's, in it's interesting because like i i what you're saying it it's like a lot of the complaints that you and i have about tv shows um where i'm like 
this didn't make any sense and that was stupid <laughs> and why did they do it this way it's like i can't help but wonder if it's like these these uh studios making these big tv shows have been sort of short changing their writing staff mm-hmm. or or you know You're doing this mini room bullshit yeah mini room bullshit where it's like well, you don't have the people on hand who would normally have sort of just sorted this out for you and yeah. given you a workable season of television. Um, that I I don't know that this is true, but mm-hmm. it kind of feels that way, right? Now, now that we're yeah. talking about this, I mean, it's just like the whole the whole industry. Like when when you had a twenty two episode TV show that ran all year, that's your job, right? Like yeah. that, as a writer, that's your job, and that is your that is what you do and you're you're involved in every aspect of production you're breaking the scripts you're writing the scripts you're editing the scripts you're helping out and that's what you do and now we've moved to this different model where shows are are 12 episodes long hell some of these marvel shows on disney are six episodes long right and and like the the sell on that that the studio gives is oh you're free to take other gigs like it it only you only have to spend three months on this six episode show and then you can go find something else yeah. which is great if you can find something else right. oh yeah everybody's favorite thing is job hunting as you yeah, know right right which is one other thing that they an ask that was rejected is that i didn't know this that apparently currently if you are a writer a staff writer on a, on a late night television show the maximum your contract can be according to the current rules is 13 weeks so you have to basically reapply for your contract every three months, basically, uh-huh. um, which is not a fun, comfortable position to be in at all. Yeah, sounds miserable. Sounds yeah. It's it's if I were if I were this writers guild, I would consider going on strike for some better <laughs> conditions. Yeah, I mean, and, and I it, it remains to be seen. You know what what like how long this lasts? What is the result of this, you know, they're, they're, the studio is of course putting out all the thing that's saying like, we we're being entirely reasonable. They're being entirely unreasonable. The writer's guild is saying the same thing on the other side. Um, I think they're very, very far off from coming together on some of these, some of these big kind of industry shifting things. And yeah, what that means for like the average consumer at home, and what their entertainment is going to look like. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Um, There was this thing that Netflix was doing that, that also happened in 2007 when that writer strikes happened called a joke box. And and that's basically what it sounds like in that they knew the writer strike was coming. They could, could sense it looming. And so they just started like collecting like jokes and lines from writers and stuff with the plans of if the strike happens, we can just put that into stuff. (laughs) That explains so much, (laughs) but actually, actually Uh, uh, under, under this specific strike. And I, and again, I don't, I don't understand the power dynamics in this whole thing, but one of the rules of the strike was specifically, you can't use those. Now, mm-hmm. how, how does that work? I don't understand how they can say that and Netflix can go, oh, fuck. Oh, oh shit, I guess yeah. we can't use those. Um, but that that is what's happening, right? Like Netflix intentionally did that. Part of the stipulation of the strike, one of the things they said is, no, that is not allowed. That is that is words that we have written. We are on strike. You cannot use that. Um, so that's going to be interesting. Um, uh-huh. You know, there was a lot of really bad movies and TV that came out. <laughs> around the last writer strike because a yeah. lot of studios just said okay we're going to we're going to go forward and do it and then quantum of solace happened mhm mhm and and so, i i'm 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 just wondering how much of like recent trends in humor is due to uh you know joke box <laughs> joke box humor or or like the 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 cliche the, the utter cliche jokes the the standard you know he's right behind me isn't he which was in like every movie for a period of time <laughs> um, um, because it's like, well, what do you want us to do? Write our own jokes. Uh, I did. God. I did just see a, um, a headline today and I haven't actually read the thing. So maybe I should have read it before I introduced it on a podcast. Like I know it as fact, but there was a report that 
one studio was planning on, ironically, using AI to write scripts during the writer strike. And then once the strike is over, having writers come in and edit and fix the scripts, um, mm-hmm. which is fascinating. And I could totally see someone yeah. doing that, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw that on Twitter and I saw a lot of um, a lot of people sneering at the idea that the AI was going to be able to write the scripts. And I was like, you need to pay more attention to where we are at in the timeline, yep. folks, because the AI is going to be doing that real soon. Yeah. And I mean, this is this is like <laughs> a this might yeah. it, it's going to be really interesting if this ends up being like the biggest you know, pressure point of this whole thing, because I do think this industry in particular, I mean, all industries, but this industry in particular is going to have to, to reckon with the idea that this is going to be very, very possible very, very quickly. Yeah. And what are we going to do about it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because if you're a writer right now, like on top of all the other shit you're worried about on top of, you know, your contract being up every three months and how exhausting that is. The idea that something's going to come along that's going to be able to do what you do exactly like you do it in perpetuity. Like s- someone has to make some rules and guidelines and some fences on this whole thing. And I have no idea how to do that. Uh, no, or I, who. I, I mean, they're welcome to try. It would be it would be great if they could figure something out that could sort of be built into our you know, way of doing things Mm -hmm. because this matters for everybody. Like, yes, writing is sort of particularly automatable because it just happens to be text. And we just happen to be in this moment where text is the thing that the AIs are getting really, really good at, but the AIs are going to be good at everything. I mean, they're, they can already write computer code as well as a person more or less plus or minus. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be massive changes due to that. You know, it could it could change what writing looks like. I, I've been thinking about this quite a bit um, because, you know, it makes me a, the AI makes me a more a more productive programmer. It doesn't it doesn't replace me as a programmer. It makes me a more productive program. I get more programming done. You can mm-hmm. imagine a world where a writer uses AI as, as a tool, as a sort of you know artificial intelligence writer's room where they spitball ideas in collaboration with some AIs who are also really good at thinking about stories and talking about stories. And maybe they say, you know, okay, all right, here's, here's the scene. Like, give me a couple like ways this could go. And then, and they kind of bash it out with, with the collaborative help of, of the AI. Right. That's why it shocked me to hear them say, um, we're, we're going to forbid the use of AIs in, in these stories. Cause I'm like, you guys are the ones who need to be learning to use the tools so that you can use the AIs. not like you got this totally backwards. This will make you more, more like like better at your jobs actually um and it's delusional to think that you're just going to have a rule where it's like yeah we're just not going to do that it's like okay no it's not gonna it's not gonna work Um, yeah i'm trying to um i'm trying to show what um what the actual words here were so i can actually report on this correctly with what they actually put in their demand um because they 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 put out this really great uh, WGA negotiation status thing where they put all the things that they wanted mm-hmm. and they put the, the AMPTP, which is the, you know, collaborative group of the studios coming together to negotiate at one. They put their response and they, they, it's really good marketing here. Rejected our proposals, refused to make counter is all over this thing, uh, which really, which really wins you over to their side. Yeah. There's yeah. all over here. It's very dramatic. Um, I like it. Yeah, it's very, very good. Why can't I find the bit on on AI? It's really bothering me. Uh, well, I can't find it, but um, it. I I don't know if it's for sure that they like said no, like can't use. Okay, regulate use of artificial intelligence on MBA covered projects. AI can't write or rewrite literary material can't be used as source material and MBA covered material can't be used to train AI is what they said. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see how any, um, I don't see how any business, especially a content business could agree to those rules and not be shooting themselves directly in, in the foot. 
uh, in this in this world that we're living in right now. That, that I guess that's my that's my feeling from from the sure. perspective of like thinking about you're you're on that side of the table. You're like you're like oh, so you want us to to ruin our business forever and and, and kill ourselves. <laughs> Like I, I, I think that I think I, I don't think the writer's side of the table understands where things are headed, honestly. And that's not really a statement about the writers so much as about like every everybody who isn't really keyed into the progress in the AI development. So mm-hmm. I don't know. No, I, I understand that. I, and yeah. I mean, I feel like in negotiation, you open with your biggest thing and you True. expect a, a counter and their counter was just annual meetings to discuss advancements in technology. (laughs) What does that mean? (laughs) It's like, wow, this AI stuff (laughs) sure getting really good, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Well, yeah, Yeah. we replaced, we replaced 50% more of you last quarter. (laughs) It's not even a real counter. That's ridiculous. No, it's, it's not at all. Uh, No, I I agree with you that, that there, there's room for some kind of, um, negotiated agreement when it comes to like how we're going to use AI and protect people's jobs T- totally yeah. valid I-, I just think the idea that like you're just gonna you're just gonna not use ai is like mm-hmm. is like that, that's that's ai is gonna be like in your fridge within the next couple of years like you're not gonna What's have gonna that do option. in my fridge it's gonna keep track of like how expired your shit's doing and tell you when you need more bacon and, and stuff like that oh good because i'm really bad at that me too i want ai in my fridge i want there to be a human level sentience that just lives in my fridge and just monitors my food. <laughs> and then it, one day it says, what is my purpose? You, say, you monitor my butter. Yeah. You, you tell me when my, when my milk is expired. Yeah. You monitor it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I mean, we'll see what happens here. Obviously like the, the immediate effects of this whole thing is like, if you're really into late night television, uh, that's, that's over for now. Um, any kind of any kind of episodic show in which writing is happening like concurrently with the production obviously can't go on. Um, probably the shows that you're watching right now, those have already been finished and those will be fine. Um, and maybe some of the shows coming out in a little bit uh, will be OK. But uh, there's going to be a, a stop of content, which, you know, I, will affect people variably because. I have so much stuff to watch right now that if all content stopped today, I'd still have years worth of stuff that I wanted to watch. Oh, I just breathed a huge sigh of relief because I, <laughs> I quickly Googled something. Um, I wonder if you can guess what I just Googled. Um, uh, is Dune done? Uh, I, it was, is Andor done? And oh, Andor. Yeah, yeah, I think Andor is done. Andor showrunner finished final Star Wars script before WAG, WGA strike. <laughs> Thank God. All well, right, that's we're the good. most important thing, right? We're good. Yeah. I don't <laughs> care about anything else. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll still follow the, the Writers Guild um, strike yeah. as we as we move through it. Um, I, I really do think this is going to be one that lasts a long time. Um, the, the things that I was reading saying we really won't know how, like, what the effects of all the demands and the difference in demand stuff is going to be till November till closer to the end of the year. So this could be something that is going to be quite, quite a while. So we'll see. Jeez. Okay. All right. Yeah. But that is going to do it for us this week. Uh, if you have any opinions on the writer strike on M night Shyamalan and knock at the cabin, you can reach out to us and let us know. You can email us at doofmedia at gmail.com or over on our Twitter at doofmedia. You can also go to our subreddit r slash doofmedia where uh, you will find a post for this episode and you can chat about it. Yeah, if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. And if you like what we do here and want to support us, consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. Head over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and pledge at any of the available levels for a whole bunch of cool bonus material. Uh, Matt just released Freeman Bros with his brother Michael just today, I think, actually. Um, and what, what were you talking about this month, Matt? It was uh, it was my brother Daniel, actually, uh, Scott. And um, we were talking about... Um, do, do, what did I say? You said my brother Michael. So. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's okay. Wow. Uh, I almost let it slide, but I, I figured that our listeners would be very confused. 
Um, we talked about the film Her, uh, the 20, 2013 film by Spike Jones starring um, Joaquin Phoenix and Scarlett Johansson, um, which I don't n- know if we've ever talked about on a podcast before. But anyway, um, me and Dale talked about it. Um, we talk about AI a lot on that podcast, and it was very much adjacent. Um, and he had never seen Her somehow. So it was a fun conversation. Remarkable. Yeah. yeah um, I don't know if we've ever done a show on that. I think we've talked about it before, but it might have been like on a like a like a compilation episode or like a list episode we did or something. I don't think yeah. we've done a full a full episode on it. Yeah, it feels like maybe a like favorite movies of such and such year type thing because it came out 10 years ago, which was before we started podcasting. Oh, yeah, it, it would definitely I think it was our top 10 movies of the decade thing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for sure. Right. Uh, Because that was definitely on one of mine because I love that movie to death. Thanks for inviting me to talk about it. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Uh, I knew knew this was going to (laughs) happen. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I actually I'm not upset at all. Okay, that's the sound of a of a man who is just kidding. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Well, anyway, um, if you want to support us, you can also give us a rating or a review over on Apple podcasts or any of these other platforms that offer the opportunity to give reviews. Each review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here. That is going to do it for us this week. I'm not sure what we're going to do next week, Matt. Uh, I'm going to see guardians of the galaxy volume three this weekend. Are you going to see that movie this weekend? I'd I'd like to. Um, I think my kids want to see it. And we will probably do that. We, okay. We've seen so many movies this spring. It's pretty fun, actually. Yeah, it's wild. Mm-hmm. Uh, so pending our both of our ability to actually get out and see this movie, maybe we'll do an episode on that next week. Yeah, that'd be fun. This will be the first Marvel movie I've seen in theaters since Endgame. Jesus. Wait, that's not true. I saw Black Panther, Wakanda okay. Forever. I, I just lied just there. There you go. But, okay. Good. But still... It's one of the one of the few I've seen right away, and I'm pretty excited about this one actually. Despite my my Marvel misgivings over the past couple of years, this is one that I've been looking forward to. Yeah, me too. We'll see you next week. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. Woo, woo. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say.